This episode is brought to you in part by The Chosen, that Jesus show your mom's been bugging you to watch. Well, they're back with their third and biggest season on the big screen this November. Learn more at thechosentickets.com. Hey everyone, I've got some exciting news. We've finally reached the point where I think that together we can fully fund Truce. That means more in-depth episodes for you, more engagement with the audience, and a healthier work schedule for me. I could finally stop driving a school bus. Our goal is $40,000. Now, that sounds crazy, but hear me out. If giving continues at its current rate, we're already 40% there. That's right, at our current rate, we're already 40% to fully funding Truce, and we're just getting started. And if we crush this goal and raise some extra, then maybe health insurance, hiring other producers, and I could even do some much-needed advertising. You can give to Truce via Venmo at at Truce Podcast on PayPal, through the mail, or via Patreon. All the instructions are at trucepodcast.com slash donate. I've also got a progress meter on our homepage, so you can follow our progress as we go. Right now, only about 2-3% to of people who listen ever give to help out. Now, not all of us want to give to something if it's not going to work. So I've set up a Google form on the website at trucepodcast.com if you want to pledge. If we meet our goal, I'll give this much, that kind of thing. You don't have to enter a credit card or anything like that, just your name and email and how much you'd like to pledge. Finally, I'm thinking about organizing a speaking tour, taking Truce on the road. If you'd like to sponsor a speaking engagement at your church or club, fill out the bottom of the pledge form and I'll be in touch. I know we don't like talking about money in Christianity, but this could be huge. I've been doing this show for about five years with another full-time job and it's getting to be an awful lot to manage. I think it's time we really go for this. Truce is unlike anything else on the market. I'm not choosing to do episodes based on how good they make my side look or to please one wealthy donor. Nor am I bashing the church or trolling the internet to see what stories will shock you. This is about discovering the backstory of how we got to where we are today so we can understand our modern moment and do better. The podcasting market is saturated with big corporations. Little indies like me need your help. Let's send a message to the podcasting world that Christian podcasting can be fun and high quality. Asking big questions, nonpartisan. Visit trucepodcast.com for more information. And God willing, I'll be updating you about our progress as we go. Okay, here's the show. This episode is part of a long series exploring the rise of Christian fundamentalism in the United States. This episode uses a lot of jargon that I've been explaining all season. Fundamentalism, premillennialism, it gets kind of into the weeds. You may find it helpful to listen to the rest of season five before starting this one. The first episode of the season is called, What is an Evangelical? The old man lay in his bed. He was dying. It was a hot summer afternoon in 1947. He'd spoken before crowds of thousands in his youth, determined the agenda of organizations, fought great fights, and lost many. He urged a young man to come closer. Now, this guy was a budding young pastor with little theological training, a prominent evangelist to the youth. Two men of God in one hot and stuffy room while a storm raged outside. The elder was William Bell Riley. Mentored by the great evangelist D.L. Moody, he preached to untold thousands before mentoring this young man who'd evangelize millions. Riley was the president of three educational institutions known collectively as the Northwestern Schools. Now he hoped to bestow that honor on the young man. Beloved, as Samuel appointed David king of Israel, so I appoint you head of these schools. I'll meet you at the judgment seat of Christ with them. The young man had turned down this offer before, but now with his mentor passing away, perhaps the pressure was too great. He agreed to step in as president of the schools. 
And that is how a young Billy Graham found himself in charge of another man's legacy. Before the big campaigns, before the meetings with dignitaries and presidents, Graham was next in line to be the head of fundamentalism. We know now that that's not what happened. Graham would be one of the great uniting figures in Christianity in the mid to late 20th century. Nothing at all like the 86-year-old fundamentalist dying in that bed. The contrast is a strong one. Graham, a uniting figure, William Bell Riley, a man born to divide. He built an organization to contend for fundamentalism, kicked the hornet's nest of cultural change, and set the agenda for the movement we're following this season, all while being a world-class racist. Now, I spent a lot of time this season telling you about a man who earned the name Mr. Fundamentalist, William Jennings Bryan. While he was important in that movement, he was not a real fundamentalist. Today, I'm going to introduce you to the man who really deserves that title. This is the story of William Bell Riley and the battle for the Baptist soul. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause on the culture wars in order to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce. William Bell Riley had inside him the building blocks for fundamentalism. He was a premillennialist, a dispensationalist, and he liked a good fight. He'd sit in Kentucky courtrooms just to watch and took part in debate competitions in high school. To put himself through college, he raised money by farming. He saved on food by eating crackers glazed with corn syrup. He became a Christian at 17 and, soon after, felt the call to ministry. It was at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary that he first met D.L. Moody. Now, Moody, as you'll recall, was not a fundamentalist, but he was a friend and mentor to many guys who formed the fundamentalist movement decades after his death. Now, they met at a revival in 1887 when Riley was just in his 20s volunteering at the rally. The two formed a friendship and Riley later invited Moody to preach at his church in Indiana. Later in Chicago, Riley's church went from 60 members to 500. Then he moved to Minneapolis where he took up his goal of evangelism. Now, his church was First Baptist, and it was a wealthy church where people paid money for seating, also known as pew rents. He did away with that practice and welcomed working class people to join. Every sermon concluded with a gospel message, and the church grew to 855 people in 1898. Now, by his retirement in the 1940s, there were 3,550 members. One-tenth of all Baptists in Minnesota went to Riley's church. Now, remember, he was one of Moody's lieutenants. Moody demonstrated to him how to build an empire. Essentially, publish, found schools, and do evangelistic preaching tours. Riley followed that playbook. He started the Northwestern Bible and Missionary Training School in 1902. Now, this would turn out to be a key piece of the story. Now, let's say you have a strongly held belief that, I don't know, maybe apple pie is the best. Sure, you can go on the road telling people about it. Apple pie is the only pie I eat. Maybe you'll win a few converts. But if you found a school, repeat after me, class, apple pie is the best. Apple, apple pie, pie is the best. Is the best. 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 Now you've got dozens of others who can take that idea far and wide. Riley's students disseminated his ideas faster than he could do it alone. Now, lots of early fundamentalists had schools for this reason. Riley had two particular concepts that set him up to be Mr. Fundamentalist. One was the personal and premillennial return of Christ, which I covered in earlier episodes, and inerrancy of the Bible. Now, inerrancy 
is a big word. So I asked George Marston for some help. He's the author of Fundamentalism and American Culture. Inerrancy usually means the Bible is, well, without error is what it technically means. Often, for fundamentalists, it means to be interpreted as literally as possible. It gets sticky, and I don't want to bog you down this episode, so if you want to know more about the ins and outs of inerrancy, I've got a bonus episode for patrons of the show at patreon.com slash truthspodcast, and it features Mr. Marsden. So Riley's got these two big ideas, that Jesus is coming soon, and that the Bible is without error. And he's got his students learning the same. Word about his preaching abilities spread through his evangelism, the school, and publishing. Now, this this growing audience meant more influence. Riley was also a dispensationalist. He thought that not only was the world sliding into darkness, so was the church. That will be important later in this episode. It was while preaching in Chicago that Riley found an enemy in the University of Chicago. The UFC was a modernist school where guys like Shaler Matthews taught. Now, you might remember Matthews from the last episode. His writings, along with those of Shirley Jackson Case, were the first shots fired in the modernist fundamentalist debate. Riley took the Bible at its word. Uh, These guys were different. We believe that religion is a human phenomenon. The Bible is one of the great human documents. Christianity is a lovely belief system, one among many others. They didn't believe in the virgin birth, the resurrection, any of that stuff. Riley debated these men on a regular basis. He grew up going to courtrooms and listening to debates. He became kind of like a lawyer representing the theologically conservative case. Just as he had students of his own going out and sharing his ideas, he didn't want the modernist school sending out modernist students. Uh, Apple pie doesn't really exist. It's just a lovely idea invented to inspire humanity. Guys like Riley got no audience in the state universities, while modernists gave lecture after lecture. That wasn't for nothing. If modernists were getting into universities, it lent them credibility, made their opinion seem in vogue, scientific. The conservatives didn't get that chance. Riley decided to fight back. By writing books and lecturing, sure, but his main contributions were twofold. First, by starting an organization, and second, by bringing the battle to his denomination. We'll start with the organization. Prophecy meetings had been going on for decades. People studied the Bible, looked at the world, Aha! and tried to connect the dots. Riley was a regular at these conferences. The horrors of World War I increased public interest. Guys like Riley, premillennialists, saw world history as trending downward, toward cataclysm. So when a big chunk of the world was duking it out, these guys thought they were in the middle of biblical prophecy and drew big crowds to conferences. So in 1918, the leaders of one conference met together to plan. By the way, this was at the home of Reuben Torrey, who I covered in the Moody's Lieutenants episode. So Riley goes to this meeting, welcome gentlemen, and proposes that they broaden the scope of the next conference. Uh, Yes, talk about prophecy, but also the threat of modernism. Modernism. And They went for it. Hip, hip, hear, hear. So at the next conference, Riley sets up this plan to sign up people, organizations, churches to join a new organization, a group of people willing to stand up for the fundamentals of the faith. This was the World Conference on Fundamentals of the Faith in 1919. The speakers were a lot of guys who, if you've been listening this whole season, 
you've probably heard of because some of them wrote the fundamentals, like James Gray and Ruben Torrey. Of course, William Bell Riley gave the opening remarks in which he made a bold claim that this meeting was an event of more historic moment than the nailing up at Wittenberg of Martin Luther's 95 Theses. And that's a bit of an overstatement. But it was at this meeting that they formed the World's Christian Fundamentals Association, or WCFA. And they spent a lot of time convincing folks to affirm a nine-point creed, including this portion. We believe in that blessed hope, the personal, premillennial, and imminent return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's about premillennialism. No surprise, William Bell Riley was chosen to preside over the WCFA. And they had some ambitious goals. Standardize books in Bible schools. Promote the organization. Assemble a list of apostate schools set up new conferences, and pull money from missions organizations where modernists were being sent out. Here is George Marsden again talking about the WCFA. He said they were... Largely Baptists, as as, uh, William Bell Riley was, who were were building a movement that would be militant for the for the faith. And one of the, the dimensions of fundamentalism that distinguishes them just from conservative Christians is they're ready to fight for their doctrinal beliefs. More mini-conferences popped up all over North America with the same guys leading the charge. This movement really seemed to be gathering steam. Christians all over the U.S. and Canada were on board, ready to fight modernism and preach Christ crucified, resurrected, and coming again. The stage seemed to be set for theologically conservative Christians to take control of the denominations, to overrun the modernists in the North. But as we'll see, they would lose, and partially because of the very things that made them fundamentalists. I'll continue the story after these messages. This episode is brought to you in part by He Gets Us, a national campaign bringing the story of Jesus to every zip code. Reaching over 1 million people daily with more than 275 million views on YouTube, this is the largest campaign ever to open hearts and minds for Jesus. Now, He Gets Us is giving churches free ways to connect to the campaign so they can leverage the moment and movement for their ministries. When you connect, you'll get resources designed to give your people new ways to have conversations about Jesus and understand the culture they encounter every day. Things like discussion guides, reading plans, sermons, and more. It's easy. Just go to hegetsuspartners.com to learn more. Then you're ready to click those buttons that say, get free tools. He Gets Us is helping people discover, rediscover, and talk about Jesus. And you can too. Just visit HeGetsUsPartners.com to learn more and join the movement. Modernists in the U.S. had this grand idea. What if they could coordinate all of their foreign and domestic work, as well as fundraising, through one big organization? So they founded the Interchurch World Movement. Now, If you're a dispensationalist like William Bell Riley, and there's this big group trying to create essentially a single denomination in the U.S., what do you think about this? Remember, he was a premillennialist dispensationalist, which meant he believed that not only was world history sliding into chaos, that there would be a one-world government. But also that the church itself would become apostate. So a one-world denomination, uh, that wasn't going to fly. Detractors nicknamed it Protestantism's League of Nations. Because remember, they didn't like the League of Nations either. 
opposition was loud enough that the Northern Baptist Convention, Riley's denomination, backed out after only one year in the IWM, along with another big denomination. And the idea collapsed. This battle over a one-world denomination sparked an urge. Conservatives wanted to have a greater voice in the Northern Baptist Convention. This is where Curtis Lee Laws, the editor of the Watchman Examiner, coined the term fundamentalist. Covering this topic in a Baptist newspaper, where a group of 154 people signed a document calling for a general conference on fundamentals before the next meeting of the NBC. That meeting happened, and who set the agenda? William Bell Riley. The goal was to put together proposals to present before the main conference. One of them was to put together a commission of nine members to investigate schools, colleges, and seminaries. Hmm, very interesting. And see if they were theologically sound. A version of the proposal was passed, and Riley was invited to be on the committee. But he turned it down. It seemed to him like a conflict of interest because his schools would also be inspected. So he declined and lived to regret it. Because one year later at the next conference, the chairman announced that they found that for the most part our schools of all grades are doing a work of which the denomination may well be proud. Of course, Riley and the fundamentalists didn't share that opinion. They were worried about creeping modernism. But how to enforce theological purity? Baptists historically avoided control from above, whether that be governments or denominations. They wanted their churches to be as independent as possible. So the NBC had no real creed. Riley decided that the only way to enforce doctrine was to pick a certain set of beliefs. So he and the fundamentalists created their own, mashing together two existing creeds, and then sat on it for a year. Until William Bell Riley gets up on stage on June 16, 1922, and announces, I'm making up this dialogue, we must adopt the New Hampshire Confession as our official creed. Here's just a little sample. We believe that the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is a perfect treasure of heavenly instruction. Essentially, it sets up that the Bible has no error, the Trinity, salvation, and even their view of the end times. Riley threw down the gauntlet. If the denomination accepted this creed, then modernist members would either have to fall in line or get out. But once again, it took years for the fundamentalists to get to this point. Modernists were ready with their own proposal. Resolved that the Northern Baptist Convention affirmed that the New Testament is an all-sufficient ground for Baptist faith and practice, and they need no other substitute. Did you hear it? I mean, it's super vague, right? No doctrine about error, the Trinity, any of it. The New Testament is an all-sufficient ground for Baptist faith and practice. This left Riley and the fundamentalists with two choices. Accept what the modernists want, or, or stand up in front of an audience and fight against the New Testament. Both poor choices. The modernists had backed them into a corner. The fundamentalists weren't about to vote against the New Testament. There were three hours of debates, three hours, ending with a plea from William Bell Riley. And the fundamentalists lost. This was a crushing blow to Riley and the fundamentalists. One that they blamed partially on other fundamentalists who weren't fundamental enough. So they formed yet another, even smaller group of fundamentalists to fight within the denomination. And maybe surprisingly, that didn't work either. This was not the only denominational fight going on in the country. 
not even the only one in which the modernists were victorious. Modernism had taken over big-name universities and seminaries, and now it seemed like it would maintain its hold on these northern denominations. This caused some fundies to leave their denominations and form their own. Not William Bell Riley. He stayed with the Northern Baptist Convention in hopes that he would, one day, turn it around. Fundamentalists had a few small successes, but for the most part, they failed to operate within the mainstream forms of power, schools, denominations, and politics. Now, there are a few reasons that they failed to take the spotlight. One, there were just too many fiefdoms, too many independent leaders with strong opinions and their own followers. It was hard for fundamentalists to submit to leadership when so many of them wanted to be in charge. Two, they never could quite create an alternate denomination of their own. They tried to take over the NBC and, as we'll see next time, the Northern Presbyterians. They somehow managed to fail at both. Third, they let their focus shift. These battles I covered today only happened for a few years. By 1923, when the fundamentalists failed to dislodge the modernists from the big denominations, they turned their attention elsewhere, to an enemy that had been poking its head up for over a hundred years, something that, by this point, many Christians were okay with. It was this battle that gave William Jennings Bryan one last hurrah. He'd failed in his run for president, missed out on killing the gold standard, tried to keep us out of war, and lost his footing in the Democratic Party. But there was one more battle for him to fight, the one for which he'd be remembered, revered, and mocked. I'm talking, of course, about his crusade against teaching evolution. I'll continue the story in two weeks. Special thanks to all the voices we heard today. George Marsden is the author of Fundamentalism and American Culture. I also relied heavily on the book God's Empire by William Trollinger Jr. For a list of sources for most episodes, visit trucepodcast.com. Once you're there, you'll learn how to support this show financially. I'm a one-man operation, and I'd love to do this thing full-time. You can help out by check, Venmo, PayPal, or if you become a monthly patron, you'll gain access to extra bonus features. Like this week, where I play more of my conversation with George Marsden about inerrancy and what it means to interpret the Bible literally. That's at patreon.com slash trucepodcast. Even if you can't help financially, please tell a friend about the show. It's a big help. You can also leave comments and ratings on your podcasting app, which helps people find the show. Truce is a production of Truce Media, LLC. God willing, we'll talk again soon. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce.